Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your renewed grace and mercy to us this morning. Lord, we pray that you would, uh, with divine help, help us to be focused and attuned and to come to this morning's lesson, uh, not just with engaged minds, but Lord, with softened hearts, with humility, and with a desire to rout out uh, our own sin, to bring it out into the light before you, confess it, and Lord, uh, in the forgiveness that we have in Christ, to be enabled to put it to death. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're continuing our uh, study of sin, and uh, we move. Last week we looked at the sin of uh, envy, um, and this morning we move to the sin of acedia, or sloth and laziness, and uh, we won't look at everything this morning, this will be a part one, and we'll finish it up next week with a part two, uh, but let me just read these quotes here at the beginning to kind of warm us up and, and, and get us thinking about laziness, Proverbs 24, verses 27 and 30 through 34. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns, the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. Here Solomon is giving us insight, giving us wisdom on the sin of laziness, and how it might destroy a man, and, and, and how it has destroyed his vineyard, his, his, um, his income, his plot of land. That refrain at the end there, verse 34, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. That is the, the credo of laziness. Just a little more. Oh, just a little rest. A little siesta won't hurt. Uh, question, we're still warming up here, but question, if we were to reverse that, what would be, according to verse 34, the credo of someone who is not lazy? Oh, yeah, uh, there, there's a common one, yeah. Yeah, uh, early, early to bed and early to rise. Or you might even just say a, a little energy, a little work a little of putting my hand to the plow. Yeah. Uh, and so rather than being overcome by little um, uh, naps here and there, little times of refreshment, uh, and, and then before you know it, your, your wall is broken down and your, your, your lawn is overgrown with nettles, well, now you have little successes. And you're building a wall metaphorically speaking, of, of hard work and, and production and fruit. Proverbs 26, 13 through 16. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. R.J. Snell says this, This American empire of desire finds limits repugnant. That line alone, just full stop, is a great commentary on America right now. Uh, we find limits repugnant. As such... Many in the contemporary West are deeply infected with the vice of sloth, with acedia, called the noonday demon by early desert fathers. Burrowed to the roots of our culture's self-understanding, 
and metaphysical dreams, sloth is enmeshed in our very way of being, our vision of what it means to be human. We have made a terrible covenant with sloth. We give it our deepest hopes and longings, and in return, sloth promises each of us our own empire of desire. What the tradition, uh, the kind of classical Christian Western tradition, what the tradition deemed as an enslaving vice is transformed into the means of freedom if we just deliver ourselves over to it, held captive to the madness of sloth. Having rejected any norms given in creation, freedom is under no authority other than the awful lightness of the will. We are free to do as we wish, including violence against all being. But what he's doing here is he's kind of extrapolating sloth and laziness and looking, I think quite rightly, at the societal decay that ensues when you allow it to infect society at large. If think about it, with most people today, you ask them, why do you work? The answer is to make money to rest and play. I like this vacation. I want that kind of home. And therefore, I do the work to get that. A desire of rest, uh, and perhaps sometimes more rest than, than is needed, is the motivation for work. Uh, that seems to me, and I think uh, 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 Mr. Snell here, uh, to be a reversing uh, of what was intended in creation. So what is acedia? Acedia comes from Greek and means a lack of care. It sounds a little like today's sloth, and acedia is indeed considered a precursor to today's sin of laziness. To Christian monks in the fourth century, however, acedia was more than just laziness or apathy. It was more like dejection that made it difficult to be spiritual, avoiding spiritual practices like prayer and Bible reading or a boredom that led to falling asleep while reading and frustration with life in general. Uh, so this, this kind of obscure, abstract word that um, we don't use much anymore, acedia, seems to be, in the older uh, way of Christian thinking, seems to be this root that goes deeper than just laziness and sloth. It's a kind of spiritual apathy, which, as I understand it, is looking at God's world and seeing the way in which God's world is ordered and being apathetic about that and therefore not wanting to do the work and even hard work of walking in the ways in which God wor God's world has been ordered. In Assyria, the Christian abhors what God has given, namely reality and the limits of order, especially the limits of one's own selfhood. Thomas Aquinas describes acedia and sloth as a sad rejection of loving, a sad rejection of intimate union with the Creator. So, since such union, according to Aquinas, is our ultimate happiness and joy, sloth very oddly rejects happiness and chooses sorrow instead. We're made for God, but sloth hates our telos. In fact, the slothful considers our purpose distasteful, even repellent, the testing, the personhood God has given. John Charles Nault, I think is maybe how you pronounce that. Acedia is a profound withdrawal into self. Action is no longer perceived as a gift of oneself, as the response to a prior love that calls us enables our action and makes it possible. It is seen instead as an uninhibited seeking of personal satisfaction in the fear of losing something. The desire to save one's freedom at any price reveals in reality a deeper enslavement to the self. There's no longer any room for an abandonment of the self to the other or for the joy of gift. What remains is sadness and bitterness within the one who distances distances himself from the community and who, being separated from others, finds himself likewise separated from God. So 
this internal selfishness that says, what's most important is me, and therefore I find doing the hard work of giving to others now a loathsome task. And think about that in, in any kind of relationship. Um, working hard to provide for your family, or working hard to prepare a meal for hospitality. Um, the the uh, desire for self, which breaks the, that kind of bond of love for thinking more about others, takes over, and now you're like, yeah, I, I don't even want to do that work. Why, why prepare a meal that way? Um, it, can, it can maybe even sneak up in subtle ways where we say, ah, let me just get some Popeyes. Uh, rather than saying, you know what, I'm really going to love my neighbor who's coming and, uh, and put in some good hard work uh, by going out and picking the tomatoes that uh, my, my family and I started growing earlier in the year. Uh, we'll cut them up. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll put in some work into the kitchen, all so that when they come, um, uh, we can really enjoy a good meal versus, uh, let me just go get some Popeyes. R.J. Snell again. It's a mistake to think that sloth is laziness. The slothful might very well be busy doing things. Evagrius, I don't know who Evagrius is, but Evagrius claims, in fact, that the slothful are often in a frenzy of pointless action. Now this, now that, in their disgust at the actual work given to them by God. We might anticipate the slothful to be very busy and as the purposelessness of their lives is revealed, increasingly destructive. More than indolence, sloth rejects the burden of order, choosing instead the breezy lightness of freedom, loving self more than relation, and autonomy more than the good. In sloth, one rejects the weight and density of living in an ordered creation. He's getting at the idea that we we were meant not only for work, but to work in love for those around us. It's not good for man to be alone. Uh, and so his work is an other-focused work. All right, there's the, the high theology. Let's look at the uh, rubber-hits-the-road biblical uh, backing. Since vice and sin are privations of good, an adequate grasp of sloth requires first understanding the virtue of good work. Itself, depending on an even more basic question, what are people for? Thus, before we turn to examine the characteristics of sloth and laziness, we must begin with an inquiry into what that which sloth loathes, or a brief study of what good work looks like. So here's my question. Has God made us to work? And if so, is our work good? Has God made us to work? And if so, is our work good? How many say no? The Garden of Eden was a place of rest and shalom and not of work. How many say yes? How many say I don't know? All right. Um, let's open up to Genesis 1. Do we see work in chapter 1, verse 1? I hear no. I see some head shaking yes. Yes, yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I don't think that there was any sweat of the brow. Uh, but there, there was work put in. And we know that, that there was work because specifically at the end of uh, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1 and going on into Genesis chapter 2. Uh, what do we see God do in chapter 2, verse 3? What's that? Yeah, yeah. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So already from the very opening verse of the entire Bible, we see work. I think we have to say it's good work. 
not only because God says it's good, <laughs> uh, but because it's God who's doing it, and God doesn't do anything bad. You read through chapter 1, and you see all the work that he does, and he's filling, and he's wisely crafting and building and creating, uh, and it's, it's excellent and beautiful. Uh, go ahead and jump to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And it was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Well, what do we see here about the imago day in human beings? To be a human that is made in the image of God, at least here in chapter 1, means what? Does it mean we look like God? No, no. How, 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 does, it, how does he describe the image of God here? Yeah, the, the, there, there's something to be done. A, a dominionizing work. So part and parcel of reflecting the image of this God who from verse 1 is at work is now male and female who in their work are reflecting God. And again, God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. There's something very good about our work. Um... Go over to chapter 2, verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land, and it was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living creature. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's the rivers in verses 10 through 14. Look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not Eat of it for the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord, verse 18, God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a, a helper fit for him. What does he need help in? Working, yeah. And now part of that, you know, part of that dominionizing work is being fruitful and multiplying. So that's a part of the work. Uh, you, you need somebody to help you make more helpers so that you can continue to grow and work uh, this world that I've put you in. He brings all the beasts uh, to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. We see some of the work already starting to happen. He's showing dominion by naming these animals. That is, um, that is an imago day kind of activity. He, he, he who names is he who rules over. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit. <clears throat> and out of his rib, he brings the woman. And the man names her uh, later on Eve. 
what do we see here about work? Well, we've already highlighted some of it, but, but just already in chapters 1 and 2, we get a rich theology of work, don't we? Anything stick out to you all? This is all before the fall. This is all before the fall, that's right. Yes. Anything else? Yes, Tom. Yeah, let's do it. Go to chapter 3, they fall, and, um, <clears throat> and, and let's look at the curse. Um, <clears throat> uh, verse 17, and to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. Um, Adam, uh, Keith, help me rem rem remind me here of the, the Hebrew for, for dust and, and earth. Adam, yeah. Uh, I didn't want to say it wrong. Um, there, is, there is an intimate relationship between man out of the ground, his dominion over the, over the earth, uh, specifically to work it, to till it. Uh, there, there is something that God is doing in making he who is to have dominion, both spirit and flesh, in his spirit, he reflects the spiritual world, but in his flesh, he reflects the ground of, of which he's to rule over. And so he is of the dust, made for the dust, and yet here in the curse, he returns to the dust, and in a sense, the dust rules over him as he goes back to the ground. But also part of the curse is that he doesn't stop working. It's just that his work is now filled with toil, and a kind of toil that um, I guess you can say is unproductive, vanity, vanity. yeah, using the language of Ecclesiastes, uh, it, it doesn't produce that which was intended when all things were rightly ordered, <laughs> antagonistic, yeah, yeah, there, there's an enmity, if you will. Yeah, between the ground and the man. Yeah. We were meant to love God and love neighbor and to work at that. And now in love for self, you start to make sense here of the sedia, in love for self, the disorderedness of that produces an unproductiveness and an antagonism and an enmity. That's excellent. We'll look at that verse next week uh, as a means of Christian encouragement to, to fight laziness. That's a great verse. Bob? Is there work in heaven? Uh, my understanding, my working understanding right now is yes. Um, now, now, heaven will be restful, but it will be restful in the sense that we work from a place of rest. We work from a place of, of peace and shalom. Yes, it was, it was a precursor to a greater, you know, a greater glory. Um, and that was given up in Adam's sin. Um, but, you know, Revelation talks about the new heavens and the new earth. You know, the two becoming one. 
And so I have no reason to think that uh, we won't be doing good work and be kind of reestablished to a rightful place as working rulers in the new heavens and the new earth. We'll mow lawns. And yeah. Yeah, Doug. When I was uh, teaching Awana Cubbies, it's amazing what they tell you. You, they want you to tell the kids of what heaven's like. It's like you're being on perpetual vacation, mm. okay? But if I had told them that, you know, God gave Adam a job and he's going to give you a better job in mm -hmm. heaven, you know, no one would want to be a Christian, Yeah, right. at least in America, okay? Because that's what they think heaven's like. You're yeah. on perpetual vacation. I think this is what R.J. Snell is getting at when he, when he says that we've entered into a covenant of sloth. Um, we, can't, we can't even conceive... Uh, uh, of work as being good. Uh, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's topsy-turvy. But in fact, I think Scripture is quite clear. Work is something intended by God to reflect his creative purposes, and it is gloriously good. Keith? Yeah, as a potential uh, perhaps counter-argument, uh, Hebrews describes, seems to describe kind of our, the consummation of the kingdom and our, our future in heaven as rest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, yeah. if, if in Eden, the work is to uh, be fruitful, multiply, tend the garden so that the earth is filled uh, with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, yeah. right? That, yep. That's how Isaiah then describes the end. Yep. So yep. Uh, it, it could be that there is no need for work in heaven because uh, it, it, it could be, I mean, Hebrews describes it seemingly as an eternal rest mm -hmm. because by definition, when Christ has returned and consummated his kingdom, the whole earth will be filled yeah. with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So yeah. there could be a potential, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. um, distinction, difference between heaven and what we see in Eden. Yeah. Good, good pushback. Um, yep, Tom. Yeah, those, those do seem to be connected. I think you're onto something there. Yeah. Uh, Patrick. Right, uh, and we'll keep moving. I'm also thinking in, in terms of uh, the new work that needs to be done to the work that created man to do. Mm -hmm. Everything that we have been allowed to do. Yeah. And now <coughs> the resting part is the maintenance part. Is the what part? Maintaining things. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Turn to First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians four. I'll start in um, verse nine. First Thessalonians four nine. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly 
and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Here is Paul speaking to those who are now resting in Christ to work hard with their hands uh, and to do so in such a way that they can live quiet lives and be dependent on no one else. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll start reading in verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor or work among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. This constant theme of work, the goodness of work, the connection between work and loving others, and then this charge to admonish, to, to call out those who are idle. Not working. Jump back to 1 Thessalonians 2. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, the Westminster Larger Catechism dealing with um, the fifth commandment, honor your mother and father. The catechism wonderfully extrapolates that and talks about um, honoring your superiors in the workplace and the sin of grumbling against bosses and not loving them well, yeah. Uh, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. I love and I'm fascinated at, at Paul putting these two words together, uh, our, our, um, our labor and toil. And that word toil has... Uh, um, Deep meaning, especially when you read books like Ecclesiastes and the vanity of toil. And here he says, it's an act of love that I committed myself to this toil so as to not burden you. Uh, skip over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> read verses... Um, uh, Yeah, I'll start in verse 6. Actually, verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that uh, he may be revealed in this time. Uh, this is not what I want to read. Yeah. Maybe chapter 3. Yep, thank you. Yep. And I put that in the paper. I didn't follow my own notes. Now we commend you, verse 6, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, so there's that word again, and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. What tradition is that? I think he's talking back to 1 Thessalonians, where he gives the example of him working and toiling, labor and toiling, so as to provide for himself and be of loving ministry to them. So I think that's the tradition that he wants them to pick up. Um, for you yourselves, verse 7, know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor, there it is again, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Notice he doesn't say able, he says willing. Uh, the church gladly supports and helps those who are not able to work. 
The sin here is those who are able and not willing to work. Let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work. And then the irony is they are busy, but they're busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Don. Yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's an exerting of energy that, that is sacrificial, is hard, is, um, is yeah, yeah. Hard labor, yeah. David Mathis. The word translated idle, or idleness, in 2 Thessalonians, as well as 1 Thessalonians, means literally disorderly or irresponsible. It describes someone who is out of order or out of line with the patterns and expectations of the community, in particular related to labor. When others wake up and head out to work, the disorderly, or the idle, sleep in and hang around. The irony is that they aren't really idle. As Paul writes with a play in words, we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. They may be idle from work, but they end up frittering away their time in unproductive ways that eventually disrupt and distract others from productive labor. It's a sin that actually, if it goes unchecked, has tentacles that reach out into your society around you and disrupt. R.J. Snell again. All too often, work is considered a curse, which it's not. In scripture, work is given to humans even before the fall, and although one result of sin is work's disorder, it is not itself a curse. As a peculiar function of the human present from the very beginning, the task of making life more human through work acquires fundamental and decisive importance. So vital, in fact, that work is central to God's original instruction of the human, telling them already in their first creation account to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Activity is necessary, showing that man is the image of God partly through the mandate received from his creator to subdue, to dominate the earth. In carrying out this mandate, man, every human being, reflects the very action of the creator of the universe. And Paul says that that is being restored, I think, here in his theology of work in First and Second Thessalonians. You are reflecting the God-man, Jesus Christ, in your good, hard work. Don't be idle. What are some characteristics of laziness? What are characteristics of laziness? Proverbs 26, 14. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. Think of that verse many mornings, uh, to my own shame. The sluggard, the slothful, the idle, they're habitually procrastinating. Like a door, there's much activity, turning this way and that way. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> Opening, closing stays on that hinge and um, and the idol uh, is constantly turning this way and that way but never really getting after the task that he needs to do just pushing it off I'll do it later I'll do it later Yep, yep, yep. I think also being content in how God has made you. Okay, so um, in seminary, I would, I would often be very late with my papers. 
I wanted every one of my papers to be like this perfectly polished, ready to publish uh, work of, of, of grandeur, right? And I'd tool around and tool around and tool around. Uh, and later in seminary, I figured out, you know what? I'm just a seminary student who <laughs> like, doesn't know anything yet. Just turn in a good paper, you know? Be okay with the C if that's what, if that's what you got. Um, and uh, once I started being content with that and just turning them in on time, even though it wasn't this excellent work of art, uh, my grades started climbing. Um, and it was this weird procrastination that came out of a self-absorption, self thinking, you know, I need to be way brighter than I actually am. No, just be me. Be content in how the Lord has made me and do the work. Uh, the lazy is happy with excuses. He's happy with excuses. Proverbs twenty two thirteen. The sluggard says, "There's a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets." Yes, you could see a lion every once in a while in uh, ancient Israel. Um, but but what's going on here is um, it's an excuse to not go outside and work. Um, ah, there's a centimeter of snow out there. Ah, I'm going to call it. Yeah, you, could, you could have gotten to work. You, could, you can go to school. Did I see a hand, man? Oh, you you, you're, you're highlighting the lion part? Um, Charles Spurgeon says, Laziness is a great lion maker. He who does little dreams much. His imagination could create not only a lion, but a whole menagerie of wild beasts. Many a times in high school and early college, I would uh, be in my car on the way to serve tables. And I'd just be sitting there, nothing wrong with me, just not wanting to go serve tables that night, thinking, all right, what can I come up with that's a pretty good excuse to not work? What, what little cough can I, can I kind of create? What excuse can I give? It's horrible. The lazy are hopeless at completing things. Proverbs 26, 15. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. Uh, it's a funny example, but you see the point that Proverbs is making here. He can't even sustain and feed himself to bring his hand back up from the dish to eat because he's so lazy. How often do we do that? Where we've start, started a task, but we never finish it. Just, if this is a habit, it's a characteristic of laziness. Proverbs 24, 30 through 31, I passed by the field of a sluggard by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone, was, uh, its stone wall was broken down. He knew what he had to do to get the work done. He just didn't do it, never completed the task. Maybe a little yard work here. I'll get to the stone wall later. But then a month goes by, and the weeds grow back up. The wall's a little bit more broken. Okay, I'll start working on the wall now, but oh, I'm too tired to get back to these weeds. And on and on the cycle goes. Hopeless at completing things. Fourthly, the idle are hungry for fulfillment. They're always hungry for some kind of fulfillment. Proverbs 21, the desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves. An interesting joining together here of laziness and desire, craving and wanting, imagining what life would be like if I won the lottery, and yet all the while just sitting there not doing good hard work to make, yeah, sure, low wages, but good work nonetheless. We'll get to you. Charles Simeon. It's plain that in Solomon's opinion, good desires, which when duly cherished and improved, will be productive of the happiest effects. Yet through sloth and indolence, issue in self-deception and ruin. Doubtless, good desires must take the lead, yea, and must move us in the whole of our Christian course. 
But as faith itself is dead without works, so are good desires of no value any farther than they are productive of holy lives. I was just going to say, even if you're rich, you've got to work at it because somebody's working to take it away from you. Mm -hmm. The idle and lazy are fifthly haughty in their opinion of self. Proverbs 26, 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. He's created such a safe space for his world of comfort that not even the wisdom of other guys coming around saying, hey, you got to do this. No, no, no. I don't need to do that. Think of the college student who knows that the test demands good, hard study. And yet, in his self-deception, he can lay there on bed or keep playing video games because he's tricked himself into saying, I'm really good at test taking. I can, I can do this. Walks in and, and fails. He didn't do the hard work of getting up, opening up the book, and studying. Scott Hubbard, meet the sluggard. He is a figure of tragic comedy. Comedy, because the sluggard's laziness makes him ludicrous. Tragedy, because only sin could so debase a man. The image of God was never meant to yawn through life. Derek Kidner in his commentary on Proverbs, the wise man knows that the sluggard is no freak, but as often as not, an ordinary man who has made too many excuses too many refusals, too many postponements. It has all been as imperceptible and as pleasant as falling asleep. That quote from Kidner ought to be a sharp mirror that we hold up to ourselves. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little relaxation. We'll look at this more in detail next week, but just so as to not leave us this morning uh, with all law and no gospel. In Christ, whose work is a perfect work for those whom he loves with a divine love, our sins are forgiven, even the sin of laziness. And in Christ, and by the work of his spirit within us, we are enabled, motivated, given new desires to work hard as unto the Lord. So that everything we do, whether we eat or sleep, or work and toil, it's all unto the glory of the Lord. We actually begin to delight in the work that God has given us, in the vocation that we're called to. Uh, be that peeling potatoes, preaching sermons, teaching children, raising families. These are good things that take energy. And in Christ, we're, we're, we're kind of conformed back in to the image of Christ, the, image, the imago Dei, glorified in us, stamped upon us, and we can walk and enjoy it. Let me give this encouragement too, and we'll look at this more next week. There is a beautiful pattern of work and then rest, Sabbath rest, Lord's Day rest, that um, I think God has given the church to help us walk uh, in the goodness of, of hard work. Uh, and the more we um, enjoy the pattern that God has given us, uh, the more we can glorify him and kill sin or sloth. Keith? Yeah, I got a couple questions. All right. Can you give some insight about that? Um, one, if, if the author about the goodness of the Lord, are there times or amounts of work that are not good in which that would be good for that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there kind of other types of work that perhaps shouldn't be? Can you work at, at good things in a wrong way? So you're not talking about, you're taking off the table like, you know, uh, the hard work of an abortion doctor. All right, that, that's, that's easy, not good work. Um, but can you, can you be a workaholic? Is that what you're getting at?
thought? really good his yeah work was, he knew that it was him. did you hear that uh, it's pretty good um, she brings up the example of uh, Jesus in his ministry um, and um, uh, crowds are swarming at him and the disciples are like Jesus look at all these people who need to be healed come on let's let's get to work and Jesus responds by saying my work is to preach the gospel in the kingdom uh, I've come to preach repentance and, um, uh, and, and, the, and the gospel, the, king, the kingdom of the gospel. Um, that's an interesting, I think that's an interesting and good, good start to, to your question. Like, yeah, is healing a good thing? Absolutely. Uh, but Jesus knew, like, that's not what I've been called to do. My, my main work, uh, the priority that the Father has given me in, in what I'm to do is to, is to preach. Yeah. Second question. Uh, this one's a bit, perhaps a bit more abstract. Um, I've heard in a bit of my thoughts over this. Oh, if you, if you truly love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And there's, uh, I think, a kind of modern uh, desire to, you know, even, you know, I've heard dads tell their kids, oh, you need to have find a job that you love. Yeah, that's really good. I bet you we probably have similar thoughts on this. Um, let, me, let me start by saying, generally speaking, I think that's okay, actually. To like, like we're, we're, not, like, we're not weird, you know, um, uh, ascetics where we were gluttons for pain just for the sake of pain and, and that's the most sanctifying thing. No, like if you can find a job that you really love to do, great. Praise God for for him allowing that, that opportunity. But I think you're, I think what you might be poking at is this strange lie that it has to be that way. And if you don't have that, then it's not good work. Um, so what came to my mind is, um, uh, Phil knows who he is, I guess he just walked out. Who's that guy that does that show, Dirty Work or something like that, or Hard? Yeah, 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 Mike Rowe. Um, he wonderfully like gets into these toilsome jobs that most of us don't want to do but the show is all about this is good work and so he's kind of made a living off of promoting the goodness of these hard toilsome you know getting down into the sewers kind of jobs and saying man these are actually the things that make society work and if we didn't have guys who did this and did it well um, uh, society would crumble. Um, so, you know, my mind goes there, like, yeah, okay, you, you, you have, um, I don't know, peeling potatoes, picking up trash, right? Um, great. Do it with all your might in love and honor to the Lord. And uh, it might not be as um, exciting and beautiful as an Instagram influencer, making a thousand bucks a week, um, <clears throat> but it's good. Excellent. 
All right, we're out of time. Um, let's ask the Lord to help us now go into the restful work of worship. Father, we pray that you would be with us indeed. Thank you for this study that we've had this morning. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us to put to death the sin of laziness. Help us to honor the work that you have called us to. And Lord, we pray that we would do our work well as unto your glory. Uh, Help us now in worship uh, to find rest in our Savior Christ. And on this Lord's Day rest that you have given us. Father, help us to rest in him in such a way that you prepare us for good work tomorrow. We pray in Jesus' name.